If you're a person who admires the Constitution of the United States and wants to restore it, as I do, then uh, we face a really hard question, really hard. And uh, we should understand the weight of it. We should face it straight. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute for Health are by the plain reading of the Constitution unconstitutional. Uh, one of the students in our class you're about to see, uh, she's the Hamiltonian among us, the most Hamiltonian among us. She argues, no, no, it's for the general welfare. And that's Alexander Hamilton's argument, and that's a powerful source, and it can do whatever's for the general welfare, she says. Well, if that's true, what limits are there? Why did they put a list of things the federal government can do? Hard question. And you don't want people starving in the streets, and you don't want uh, the Grand Canyon filled full of sewage, and uh, you don't want smog to obscure the Grand Tetons. You want to be able to drive across the country. The federal government built those highways. We should maintain them better. So uh, what about that? You know, it's uh, hard to make the case for limited government. Okay, we're gonna talk about big government. Let's make the case for it. Do you think there needs to be an FDA? That's the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. You think so? Mm -hmm. And it's not in the Constitution? Correct. Correct. Um, EPA? No. We did. So uh, Tim's opinion then is that he doesn't care if the environment gets raped. He just doesn't want people getting hurt. No, I didn't agree with the FDA either. You didn't agree with the FDA either. You're <laughs> a hardcore guy, right? But you've seen the, uh, you ever seen the photographs of the thalidomide babies? Mm -hmm. yeah. The drug thalidomide, it was called, and mm -hmm. women took it when they were pregnant and they got babies with very distorted limbs. And you know those drug companies, they make money selling drugs. They might not be as cautious if there wasn't somebody to license them to sell the drugs. Uh, do you think there should be a National Institute for Health? No, why not? Um, I think its primary object is research oriented and I think that private organizations could do that more efficiently. Mm, so you guys are conservatives. Uh, I'm going to find one. Some of you agreed with the FDA, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. How many? Let's vote. Let's have a vo our first yeah. vote, right? Mm -hmm. Two, four, six, seven. Ten. Are we ten of us? Yeah, we have ten. Ten. So, eighty percent of the students at Hillsdale College, by this poll, and admitting that the average student is smarter than these kids, <laughs> uh, they believe in the FDA, and it's not, it's not in the Constitution. So 80% of us are loose constructionists. So I'll tell you why I bring this up. Um, for most of the history of the United States, the government was about 10% of the economy. Most of it state and local, not federal. Hmm. And now if you count the cost of the regulatory state, it's more than half of the economy. Uh, the number of laws made in the Congress has not really increased significantly in 100 years. Congress still works kind of the way it always worked. So the point is, the government's got really big, and some of the arguments for that are the ones I just named. Right, there are crying needs. It's one country, environmental harm goes over borders. Smog and stuff like that. Uh, so there are arguments that there are crying public needs and the government should uh, address them. Do you think there's flexibility in the Constitution to meet that argument? Mm -hmm. Emily has stated that uh, she has an opinion about that. Explain that, Emily. Um, yes, so I think that um, 
public needs and how that fits into the Constitution is related to um, the debate that goes back to uh, James Madison versus Alexander Hamilton and the interpretation of the Constitution. For example, they debated over whether or not the general welfare phrase um, in the Constitution was an extra power that was given to the government or whether or not it was a summary of the previously named powers. And Hamilton... So there's an Article 1, Section 8, mm -hmm. where the Constitution says roughly that it can... Uh, tax and spend, I think it says, yes. for the general welfare. Mm -hmm. And if memory serves, James Madison actually argues that that clause was badly written because what they had in mind was that they could tax and spend to pay off the debts that the states had incurred in the revolution as long as those debts were incurred in the general cause of winning the Revolutionary War. And uh, Hamilton read it as, we can do more stuff. And uh, Madison's counter to that was, okay, why do we have a list then of things we can do? Why is it say you can do these things if you can also do anything else that promotes the general welfare? How does that make any sense? And Emily is a Hamiltonian that's, she's a big government girl. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, she is, by the way, the very problem that we face. And the loss of our freedom is, is reposing in the soul of that girl right there. We're, we're done now. <laughs> She'll put up with anything. Now, there's something to it, though, right? Because uh, epidemic or a pandemic, you'd have to fight that nationally somehow. And maybe you could do that by cooperation among the states. And so what Emily indicated is a prudential argument. You're going to build up this government, and it's going to be supreme for national purposes, but only for they. And the unspoken part is national political purposes, things that have to be done for the nation to be a free nation and well-governed, right? That's one kind of argument, right? And that argument has gone on from the beginning. And there's been more than one view about it among people who were, however, very friendly to the idea that there are limits on the government and they mean something and they can't be breached because it has to remain a liberal society. And by liberal, they just mean that, you know, if you're going to have all the sovereignty out here in this big circle, it needs to be pretty big if it's going to control something as powerful as a government without being in the government. So that little circle has got to be a lot littler than everything else, and in economic terms, it isn't anymore. Now it's about the same size. And I say that came to be partly for some things that looked to me like pretty good reasons. There are three kinds of questions that come up because of this transformation of the government. And, and I want to emphasize, it is a transformation. It is huge, right? It's changed a lot. And there are three things to notice about the change. One is, almost all laws are made in a different way than they used to be made. They are most laws, the great majority, 90%, some bigger percentage, are not made in the Congress anymore. They're made in these regulatory agencies. But in almost all cases, the regulatory agencies also enforce these laws. And they also hear disputes that come arise under these regulations they pass. So the three branches of government are united in the single hands, as they are in the hands of the maker, the creator in the Declaration of Independence. That's a problem, right? So that form is a problem. So when you, when you have hundreds of lawmaking bodies, as we do now, then they start making these really technical, complex laws and nobody knows what they are. It's so large now that it becomes a factor in the politics of the country, sort of as a separate interest. The government is kind of a separate interest now. And, and that is a problem. Whatever you're gonna do about that problem, by the way, and that's a big problem. I, I, I can't sit here right now and say that I know exactly what to do about it. But then there's 
a final problem. And we want to talk about that at length. <laughs>